Welcome back to First Principles. I'm your host Rohan Dharma Kumar. Whether you're a first time listener or a returning one, thank you for listening to us. I'm thankful that you choose to spend a few hours with us each month when there are so many other podcasts, so many other things out there. Today, we have a super cut episode. Normally, our conversations go deep with one specific guest, but every now and then we zoom out and go broad by stitching together a multi guest conversation and the invisible thread that connects the conversations with five founders we pick for today is company culture what's the best way to empower your talent what do founders expect from employees and how do they build their company cultures you know this is where it gets interesting in most cases our guests have differing opinions on these subjects but while putting this episode together we kept encountering one word or a substitute for it in some cases and that was patience patience in the way that they give feedback to their employees patience in investing in your employees building this patience not just within themselves but within the entire organization there are some very interesting perspectives in this episode on how these founders approach and practice patience among the other principles of leadership and management let's get into it First up, we have Krish Subramanian of Chargepi, who has a simple and powerful dictum: "Move the chairs and get out of the way of good people." At Chargepi, you wouldn't fit in if you limit yourself to a strict hierarchy. He sees employees more as his peer group. Among the many examples Krish brought up in our conversation was an instance where the opportunity to give feedback led to an employee who was about to leave deciding to stay on at the company, and how. all of this is part of charge peace culture i i want to take you back to something that you mentioned at least twice in our conversation which is move the chairs get out of the way hmm. of good people right so what does that really mean when you say get out of the way how does that translate into what you do as a leader hmm. trust that one is uh, trust them to solve the problem but before that there is one crucial step right which is have they understood one the significance of what we are actually trying to solve are they acknowledging the problem current state as it is or are we in denial and as long as we are actually on the same page with respect see ultimately in oh, sorry com- i'm i'm still yeah. going to ask what does get out of the way mean <laughs> get out of the way means because it's trust them to yeah. solve the problem right and then you but why are then you, you in check the way? in right so why are you in the way so delegation without review is abdication right so you delegate you trust them to solve the problem but you if you are responsible and ultimately if you are still responsible for that area then you still have to check in with them for progress and hold them uh, have that conversation to ensure that it's actually progressing the way you would like right so that is general working style and within that uh, to be able to do this get out of the way what is one more important step that is there is to ensure that they have understood we are on the same page with respect to the problem definition the current state of things that we are asking them to fix or okay, what can i can i flip this question sure. what does being in the way look like uh being in the way look like you you since you're a, saying uh, yeah, yeah, getting yeah, out of the way yeah, yeah so you give the problem to them right and then you continue to obsess about it for me right being in the way would mean i say when i work on entitlements so here is what you need to do and then instead of actually trusting this person just agreeing on some contracts to say hey just make sure that you talk to these these types of people and build enough context come back to me with your learnings and then do xyz things and then just run with it i keep doing most of the user study and then go and tell him what to, micromanaging to some like yeah micromanaging is over simplified word but basically even simple things like telling him insights instead of trusting his learnings from customers i still continue to trust my hunch more than the information that he is actually is gathering first time is that not a very time. hard thing for a founder to let go of did you find it easy to let go of this um 
if you are going to trust somebody to solve the problem, right? One is, uh, do they have the skills and why did you actually trust them with? So you trust your own decision process of why you are interesting something with somebody and then allow them to do the job by not um, overriding them through your hunches. That I think and, is more important than micromanaging, right? We we call it review. Review is important, right? Micromanaging does not mean don't do reviews, right? Review is continuous check-in, enable them, unblock them to win distant process. For example, there is a new product that we have been building. Um, one of the things like my 20 minute chat with the uh, three member team that's actually building is, um, okay, what do you guys need? Where are you? Like we have early four customers in the pipeline. One is already live, super exciting stuff. But how do I get 10, 20 customers is a question they are running with. I could actually tell them that, okay, take our freemium product. We already have $250,000 freemium that we offer to our early stage customer. Make it a million dollars and offer this to early adopters of this product and tell them that I'm actually going to bring more value to you. Why don't you become, why don't you talk to us and explore this new product? Ask for 15 minutes through that. I can actually make that kind of a decision by giving them the tools to succeed. And I'm able to help them kind of with that decision. Probably they will not be able to make themselves. That is unblocking. If I were to go tell them, oh, those four customers, they are all early stage startups. Why don't you actually start talking to some of these big customers who also look like they are talking about this problem? That I think is getting in the way because then I am actually letting my instincts overrule their actual scientific method of... You are leading them instead of letting them lead. Huh, letting them lead that, right? Because they are the DRI. They are the directly responsible individual for the success and failure of that thing. And allowing them to own is the in the best interest of the company and those individuals. So they can actually continue to own it and succeed or fail. That's okay, right? But it's important that it's their thing rather than uh, making the decision, then you hold them responsible is the worst thing to do. Got it. Krish, what's Chargebee's culture, if you are to define it very simply? Okay. <laughs> um, if I try to define it through the documented values in some ways, right? You sound is... kind of skeptical about <laughs> that. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, you, you really tell me that uh, very... the values came up roughly about, what, seven years seven after? Seven years into the journey, because we, as, see, we, we did not feel like... Um, writing down what we would consider as values, but because some things have to organically come together, right? The way we work and then distilling it is much better. Uh, I, I don't think we even planned for it. It is that we never had um, this need to actually document this because you end up always, we all end up accumulating the kind of friends just the way we actually accumulate your colleagues. You pick people that you like working with for a reason, right? And then some people will reject you um, and move on. Uh, are you move on? Uh, one of these two things happen. And ultimately that tribe of people becomes, that early tribe ends up attracting more of similar uh, people and uh, there are certain things that you cherish, right? It's not like, it's not and, a monoculture and yet... And rejecting some people as well because like you yeah, said... Yeah, the system rejects. The system rejects people, right? As a uh, as can all I group ask of you, people. Can I ask you what kind of people does the charge be system reject? And by that, I don't obviously mean like formally reject. Yeah, not, yeah, not everybody who leaves is necessarily rejected. But no, at the no, same I'm, time, I'm huh, not talking about who correct. will, what are the kind of people, people who will not succeed well at charge B? Who will not fit in. People who expect strict hierarchy, I don't think will succeed. The reason is, for example, somebody who is hierarchical in their behavior will also expect me to be hierarchical with them, right? As founder and CEO, because if I actually make decisions, they expect me, they, they will also look up to say, have you made a decision? Have you made up the mind? What do you want becomes a question. Then what I want becomes a mandate. And that's what they actually want to implement to please me or, or to align with me. Right. I agree. I don't think that works well for us because, yes, I'm a CEO. I'm the CEO responsible for certain things. But the way we actually work is more like peers, like my direct reports. I want to work with them more as peers. The reason why we have continuously upgraded and brought in change makers and senior leaders into the organization is because I have never been walked that path and that journey and I'm not a specialist in each of those areas. So I have a group of people and people who can counsel me with different perspectives where 80, 90% of the decisions they are going to make. But the 10% of the decisions that needs a debate and probably alignment, they should be able to bring up those perspectives and we, I maybe if it is hunch-driven decision, maybe like wherever there's data, 
decision is clear wherever there is a hunch or like somebody has to be a uh, deal breaker then i make the decision i think stylistically that works well for us rather than someone who expects most of the decision to be hierarchical Got decision it. hierarchy is one what are some of the other things that somebody who's uh, close like the growth mindset is not there like hey, it sounds actually cliche to even say that for me because i don't know almost everybody wants to say that right and will say that but for us if that see if there is a skepticism cynicism is there about like for example um, all hands if you take the case of all hands um it's very hard to make depending on the context in which uh, uh, some people have past experiences and different the countries hands, and all of that the all hands is all, your all hands for meetings, context is the uh, yeah. weekly weekly or monthly all hands meetings you right that you have with your team depending on your previous experience the relationship between you as a employee and your employer many a times is also colored right i don't judge people based on that but i just believe that so there is some level of dissonance or like distance that people sometimes maintain depending on the relationship and past experiences people have had that employer is out here to screw my happiness or like there is something that they are going to what is a catch right is always there there are uh, and i'm completely okay where people are skeptical and coming in because you don't hire um, thinking everybody has to like sing your praises and then like be a fan and all of that no right Uh, i'm completely comfortable with a mutual contract that is honored and respected and uh, you bring your honest work and skills to the table and we do the like we create value for you and all of that stuff but what doesn't work for me is continuing to hold on to that cynicism and not ever be able to let your guard down to understand who we are is a lack of curiosity then you are letting your past dictate your future that doesn't work well right which is because my na- by nature right thankfully uh, i am somebody who is very comfortable showing vulnerability like and uh, within the company we are to a large degree very transparent and even things that we are not transparent about we tell them that sorry i'm not going to actually tell you if you are going through like for example several fundraisers that we have done in the past um i i used to go tell the team like sometimes even before announcing one week or there was one instance one month ahead of actual announcement we told the entire organization but we trusted everybody to keep it quiet to get the most because there are lots of impact. things that like can there go are wrong a lot of things that can go wrong but still money in the bank is in the bank i tell them that till the money is in the bank i'm not going to tell you and i don't want a distraction because we are not dependent on raising that last round of funding to keep running the company with or without that we can do that and yet if something goes falls apart and we don't close the round because somebody is asking for let's say a governance structure with some control as a last round of financier we don't want to give that we want clean governance so which means the deal might fall apart every for everybody else might it feel like a failure and then the morale can go down that is something we don't want to inflict on everybody right so there was nothing that had changed between the previous before the money came in or the money did not come in um and yet it can feel like a failure so we are not going to distract the organization my job is also to ensure that we are focused on what is important which is serving the customers building the product those are actually more important so i'm not going to distract the organization so these are things i will not tell you transparently when you see charge be now and what you're doing as a game how do you define that game ha huh. see there are different types every individual is different right so not every Broadly, single a person cult- looks at, at it as level. like work is not life and uh, absolutely yeah, that is how it should be right every... to that point exactly what yeah, you just mentioned correct right and there is a certain like there is a wiring mm, man manu- i call it as manufacturing mistake with that we, some of us have where work becomes a large part of your life and definition like and that is okay and then there will be a lot of people who actually treat work as work as a 9 to 5 thing and that's okay right you need the mix of healthy mix of all kinds of people uh the game that i think everybody should play is that great work ethic you have a social contract with your relations that you have friends and all of that the same way you have a enter into a relationship a contract with your employer as an employee what is asked in return is that work ethic of the job job definition where you obsess about a customer and you can have internal customers or external customers but your job is to understand the needs of a customer solve the problems and then derive economic value from it is basically the game that we choose to play the intensity with which any person chooses to play or the lightness and all of that the lightness right um, that is completely different so you can still be in serious business like you can 
you uh, <laughs> what how do we say this right you um we can be in serious business but you still don't have to take yourself seriously the silliness right and creativity is necessary like like kid like enjoyment when it comes to approaching things is necessary so that lightness is necessary and yet you know that you are into the integrity of the contract is super important that work ethic and all of those things that's all that's expected right um like for example if you cannot work for let's say a couple of days this particular week or like this particular month you are having a personal situation where like you need to spend more time with your kid go talk to your manager and tell them that hey this particular month the three days that i'm four days i'm going to work I'm, i can actually do this or these core hours i can do a lot more these hours i actually i want to be able to prioritize this we are completely comfortable and i would appreciate people wanting to have those kind of conversation transfer and conversation and be able to establish that contract and i i would like the managers also to be empathetic right i would be very annoyed if managers actually don't understand this right their managers don't understand this but um like owning that is the part, very much part of the integral to the contract right that's a game that everybody sh- i would ideally like everybody to play i want to back it up a bit krish because i sense this i i think i have it you have it a lot of people have it as well which is essentially the hesitation to perhaps say that work can be enjoyable yes. and work can be fun and yeah. that work can be happy because i think we somehow as founders get defensive and say look it does not mean that you need to give your you know turn over your personal life to it yeah. but i look at it a very simple point of view if you're going to spend 8 hours of your day at you might work might as well do it well <laughs> might as well enjoy yeah. what you're doing might as well play it as a game Correct. right as opposed to and i think this is a relatively i think you know i mean over the last maybe like 3 4 years it's again coming up which is essentially it's a strict contract and i'm doing it because i'm paid a salary which is all right but as an individual if you're given an option where salaries are the same and in one workplace you get to enjoy and have fun and do things that you like and you're good at and in the other one it doesn't really matter which one would you rather pick right so it's a no brainer in some level for me and i do feel that that is fraying a bit where some of us especially the younger generation thinks that it's wrong to want to have fun at work or Correct. to be happy at work. Correct. It's a over simplistic one, right? The moment somebody says work is fun and all of that, everybody thinks that, that, that I'm not asking uh, for like 80 hours or anything like that. I'm exactly. just saying actually have fun, right? You can do it for even if you're a deferred life plan, right? But like the 10 years that I actually spent in all these companies or Raman worked at Zoho, he never wrote his own CV. Uh, KPS co-founder, he never had a LinkedIn profile for 10 years, right? And he never had written... his cv even once and seven years into charge b was the first time we had to make him write a cv because we had to apply for his us visa right so there are people like that who actually had like we all had fun and i actually had a very enjoyable time in all the jobs but i also had a deferred life plan of actually planning to want to start up not actually having a time frame when but you can do both right uh, if like then my life did not have to be miserable or think that okay things suck at tcs or things suck at any of those companies for me to want to start up it was actually enjoyable and i gave it i feel like i gave it my all and that's how i learned whatever i was able to pick up in my job and that's the only way you can choose to do things in a way it's meaningful and with satisfaction when every time we look back how do you manage to see outside your own biases and bubbles especially as a founder see <laughs> you need somebody who will call your bluff <laughs> continuously and right i'm assuming somebody one set mirror. of people are your co-founders <laughs> but other than that do I you have any i think the silliness actually helps build that relationship with all your peers as well like peers like you know, co-workers and all right when we are actually deviating from some of these things that we have said but jokingly people should be able to point it out to point our own like deviations uh, or like slight changes i think if that is there without heaviness of struggling to actually point it out that's when it becomes a cult or a particular behavior where the the, the like you form a hero or your role um defines the the what is a hero worship kind of a behavior that nobody is able to point out flaws 
becomes a trap right and uh, one of the things is thankfully uh, one thing we consciously are trying to work on is how do we have that circle of people continuously in the organization not our in circle or anything but a lot more people are able to comfortably point out that okay hey did you notice that you actually did something different right and it could be right or like better any of those things but that's light conversation needs to happen to be able to point out things show the mirror and that's helpful right because none of us are trying to be perfect but it's just um just being able to operate as colleagues with mutual respect right if you are in the trenches and then you are working, working together why not have that mutual respect where we are working only as peers and colleagues um some of that doesn't have to reflect it's it's if somebody is able to point it out it's a credit to them um plus you earned one more person who actually is uh, you are able to comfort, get comfortable with what's the best way to give feedback to you hmm my wife would love to know the answer <laughs> best way to give feedback mm. the best way the best time um actually the best way to give feedback is by um not wanting to control my situation right meaning the best way to okay now i'm telling the opposite how not to give feedback but the best way to give feedback is to ask hey can i tell you give me a feedback can I give you a feedback seeking permission when i'm in the receptive mode immediately second is to just say here is my story or here is my observation i have nothing to dispute it was your observation i think that generally goes a long way where anybody can share anything and that is something we try to strongly encourage there have been instances when um, internally when somebody wanted to give a feedback to a cxo right and then they were actually feeling very miserable inside the organization and this is an individual contributor i remember a particular instance where i was able to draw up on my lesson from conscious leadership to go t coach play the coach role to tell them actually you know what i can go give the feedback i realized this happened and i learned about it but you are that that person was trying to quit and i said okay why do you want to quit and all of that and then this person was extremely frustrated with the way they were treated and then felt miserable or like and um um felt insulted right and i said okay you can choose to quit but do you actually not like working in this company the person is actually absolutely loved working in the company which is why like i the information surfaced to me during exit interview that's how i reached out and said okay if you want to quit absolutely quit but would you be able to say you are walking away without any regrets or will you actually think i wish i was able to say this and still quit if nothing changed then uh, the person said actually you know what you are right i wish i could actually say this but i don't know because i'm scared uh, hierarchy and all of that i said but you have quitting if you imagine that your career will not be jeopardized in any way and i will actually you can use me as a reference and i will personally vouch and make sure that you are able to land anywhere that you want to go then you can remove the fear of actually this career being um, colored because of this relationship but would you still want to give the feedback so you can actually move on without regrets the person said yes and i said let me help you frame the feedback it will also help the person you will also realize that maybe the person did not even realize that they created a situation like this it was a breakthrough moment for the person when they wrote down the feedback saying this is how i felt this is this happened these were the facts during this conversation you did not let me talk and then you overrode everything that i said and then you went on a rant for the next next fight and minutes which had nothing to do with the things that i did here is my feeling here is my story because of all of this i even came to a decision where i am not valued and i was actually thinking about leaving moving on from the organization and this is not how i actually thought charge b will actually work and i actually love the company i love working with my peer group yet this particular conversation led me to this kind of decision and i asked this person to give that feedback directly to the cxo instead of even me relaying it and i said don't copy me don't even tell this person that i know about this surprisingly the person picked up the cxo picked up the phone asked for a call talked to them and apologized and they realized that both of them had the right intent right place in the heart and the person said okay i shouldn't have reacted this way and the cxo apologized and something changed and then the person came back saying i didn't like for me i feel lighter because i could give feedback to a cxo and come out of the conversation more positive i don't want to quit i would rather be in a company that allows me to be able to give feedback to anybody so i would stay and the person continues to stay and do well right 
so uh why did we go into this uh, tangent uh, i think mostly it comes down to how to give feedback right i think for me learning to give feedback or receive feedback again um over time we all pick up different ways in which we all work but i think even being able to play the coach opportunity to actually teach somebody else like ignoring the power structure but treat somebody else as a peer regardless of their title to actually be able to do that was a breakthrough moment for me also to like be able to like coach somebody to give feedback <laughs> next we have varun dua of aco insurance who spoke about growing in a company from an employee's point of view one of the things he told me was when you find something you love you should be at it for 10 to 15 years because it's the payoff of years of perseverance that is fruitful and not the short term gains you might make along the way it's the power of compounding and he believes jumping around to build a resume doesn't allow for this compounding he also discusses how he spots the right talent and why your outcomes matter more than your decorated career with the benefit of hindsight what's yeah. your advice to others when it comes to looking at your career and pursuing something that's of interest to you what's what's your advice yeah i i i think uh, uh i think i i'm a little old school uh i i think whatever you like doing you should give it like 10 15 years uh i think when i take founders or professionals whichever whichever way and and i uh, uh, i think some some founders have a attachment to the space for whatever like they could have worked in it or they have a you know unique insight to it or whatever it is i think those journeys last um because you are not looking at it as a valuation or you're not looking at i in short tech was not a word when i you know uh, i i i didn't coin the word or it came i like oh i'm i'm doing in short tech apparently you know uh, in 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 some sense for for me the space was important or it became important i think if you have that attachment how many ever pivots you need different companies you need you'll keep sort of banging your head against the problem till you get there and somewhere hopefully there's some successful outcome uh, at the end of it but if you get down to a fad you know i want to do crypto i want to do web3 i want to do you know uh, you're not allowing for to use a financial term compounding you're not allowing your thinking is not compounding your you know i want to do like uh, social e-commerce is like the big thing i'm not saying the people who are doing it don't have attachment to the space but i've also met enough people who are doing it because it's the hot thing china so mein chal gaya yeah to use the same financial yeah. analogy it's like if you're investing by putting money into one mutual fund one year and then taking it out reinvesting into yes. stocks and then versus yeah picking great funds or stocks and yeah. allowing them to compound over 10 or 15 years we have evidence that almost always the compounding strategy yeah. wins it, and it wins and 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 i say this you know with humility the 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 depths that i have gained i i can challenge that a lot of people in this space have not can i have just been at this problem for 15 years i still don't think i know half the things that how to solve it but it's not the and and uh, people ask me you know if i couldn't happen if the gov- i said i would keep trying like i i would find you know the next task. i don't know what else to do like n- nothing else is as interesting to me as this is and even with professional other team members who work in our team uh, i keep telling them that you know most most people who will take flip card for you know we all had that 700 million dollar esop let's even take a monetary lens or material lens to things right the people who made the money on that were people who lasted the journey uh the people who hey hey i want to become avp i want to become like i want to be head of product i want to be you're not giving me this opportunity blah 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 and keep flipping and not really deepening their skill set their ability to manage teams their own compounding but they actually i've never seen them make money their esops never vest they they they're just not there for the you know the the day the price is there they they have just already optimized for the short term uh again so i think my my advice or philosophy is just as long as you can go if you can come in as a founder or as a professional that see things can go wrong and you may have to make some shifts or whatever it is unless you're in the wrong place i should just give it 10 years often like you know when people are young it's like i wish i had a million dollars yeah i wish i was like, like what's that for you right now what's your most ambitious success to me i like definition? i to, to me i want to uh let me put it, I, i'll i'll say two things uh i want aco to be pub, a public company i want aco to last beyond me you know and and not be a 
sell out situation i think financial services companies like hdfc or icici or even kotak first gen right kotak is for, they can be massive and they can be large institutions uh i'd love to build an institution like that in india that maybe i have to hang my boots 5 10 years from now or whatever it is or maybe i'm not the right guy to run it but i think we are in a place where at least aqua's business model the space that it is in i think it has a shot at it to me that that will be success uh that it lasts beyond me uh it's not some uh company that has to be saved because it continues to burn money and you need to find a buyer i think that will be very uh, very important to me second uh i am a res- uh, i would like people who work in aco to say good things about aco when they leave i think that's important to me people will leave they will have different career aspirations they'll fulfill a part of their career in aco i don't there, there'll be some who who've been there pre inception they're still there 6 years 7 years i think they'll do 10 15 years also with aco some will learn a lot we will learn from them the 4 5 3 years that they give and they'll move on but i think it's important to me maybe i'm vain or whatever it is i don't know i want people to say hey i learned it was a good place i think that's important to me when when we've had a disgruntled employee leaving and saying it hurts me that they said aco is a shitty place something went wrong with them maybe things didn't align but uh, i would not like to be remembered as a company which treats it's uh, like to be remembered as a company which treats its people very well i think that's important to me yeah in many ways what you're saying are all aligned if it's an institution that is around 20 years from now yeah. 25 years from now chances are it needs to be an institution which is able to retain yes. people grow yes. people etc yes. and all of that yeah and and right. we are very frankly we are very proud of that we've had most of our initial people are still there most of them i would say 80% of them are still there some who come in don't align and then leave quickly uh, that has also happened but yeah i'm i'm quite uh, uh, proud of the fact that those people continue to believe in aco and continue to believe in where we are going you've obviously hired a lot of people over the years yes how do you spot talented people what are you looking for i say right now my hit rate about and let me talk i'm i'm not talking at maybe people who are just starting their career or whatever it is but at least people who are mid or senior management my hit rate i would say is still 50% of where i thought the guy was great or the person was great and when they actually came on board uh, like half the time has worked out very well half the time it's just not i was probably elated in the interview and finally I, it didn't work out for me or it didn't work out for them so i still don't know uh, is my uh first so answer I'll, yeah yeah please continue yeah uh that i still don't know uh, there are some telltale signs uh i know what to avoid uh, versus really what to look for uh i think it's a little bit of elimination uh, for me like even asking you know I- i'll give you an example one of the pet questions that i ask in you know in an interview is while while trying to get a leader on board is if you had like the same question you asked me actually coincidentally and that's why i remember it last 10 years in your career you wanted to change something if there was anything that you'd do differently what is it that you would have done differently if anything and you would be surprised that very few people have the humility to say i did these three things wrong and you know and i or i handled my team badly I don't think I didn't think I coached them enough. I didn't I I think my team was operating in silos and I you know and 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 I had to learn the hard way. A lot of people you know uh oh I should have some people even take it back to oh I should have taken an admission here or I should have jumped that job. It's about what would have worked for them better. You know uh versus telling thing hey how they could have operated and contributed better. it's a very clear sign to me of somebody who is constantly looking to improve and better themselves versus who somebody who's improving their outcomes uh their outcomes will improve as a you know uh, as a by product of if they do this part well but i think that to me is like a telltale sign it's very difficult for people to answer the question how do you organize your week like just just answering your best like what do you do time to spend time hiring half the time you'll realize at least i've learned to realize that people react to the work that lands in their inbox versus saying hey i have a very clear plan my team parts of my team are weak i need to spend 
consciously a day a week mentoring them coaching them whatever or at least spending time with them i need to do my reviews a certain day i need to build my future team capacity or whatever it is that i need to do they don't have a plan you know uh so some of these not that i do or i'm perfect at these things but i know that these are things that i need to improve to get to do my job better uh but i think people i tend to stay away from if i can be honest is people who don't even have an awareness of what learning or what they need to improve or whatever it is i'm not looking for perfection and yeah. i think that question that you asked right like you know what would you do differently and i think you talked about outcomes the way i look at it is that you know the response that you get is that is the person saying that if i had done this di- you know differently this is how different my resume would look yes, today absolutely. versus how different i would look as a yes. person yes you're trying to look for yeah you know you talked about awareness you're yeah. essentially trying to find people who are keen to grow as persons and people yes. not grow their resume because yes. the resume is the outcomes yeah yeah Yashish Dahia, the co-founder of Policy Bazaar, was quite candid in our chat. He spoke about why employees who spent up to five years at Policy Bazaar are still considered new employees. We also talked about how there are two conflicting qualities that one must have when working at Policy Bazaar. But perhaps most surprisingly, Yashish also went on to explain why he distances himself from making hiring decisions. As a leader, do you have any tips on how you identify and groom potential leaders you spoke about future potential same uh, same thing here i like to see truthfulness i like to see so the, so the one trait that we classify in policy bazaar is an iota of selflessness and both those words are very carefully used we don't expect you to be selfless all the time you have to be selfish to survive also and to succeed and i want people to be smart and selfish also but at times you shouldn't be a person who doesn't have the ability to be selfless that i just don't have the ability at all i can only think myself you know there's some people who will create a 100 rupee loss for the company for 1 rupee of their own benefit no that is something we cannot have and i know it sounds weird but that happens all the time in the corporate world right and in any part of the world right um, so we spot that iota of selflessness somehow and at over 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 a lifetime you start developing a pattern a matching on that uh when people come into the organization who don't match that profile very quickly that gets like they stand out like a sore thumb in the organization and the organization is very harsh on them very very rapidly so almost it like a body turning on a foreign agent that yeah yeah it's, it's almost like hr doesn't need to get involved those people know they are they are outsiders here and it gets caught up in everything and we are extremely transparent as an organization so people almost start calling it out uh and we have and these are sp- seen in small small things like you know uh we don't have anything like um, what time you come into office what time you don't but on a day that there's a problem and on the day when you also have a personal commitment let's say and depends right if your kid is un- unwell that's a different issue but if you're going to see a football match and you've bought a ticket for 50000 rupees let's just say are you able to walk off from that ticket because you have something serious that you need to solve right we look for those kind of things uh and and we find them and honestly the 50000 rupees doesn't matter in the long term so we basically look for silly decision making that sometimes people do and if you're a silly decision maker you won't last at policy it's it's very simple culture is obviously very important for you how have you as a founder i like try to, to build and evolve yeah. so your I culture so i like to explain to people that the biggest traits for success at policy bazaar long term are going to be patience and trust either you trust us or you don't trust us if you trust us be patient at times it may appear we're not being fair to you but you show me cases where we have not been fair to people for let's say 5 years 7 years show me cases look around the organization see people see how they have done and see if we have been unfair to people over a medium to long term period sometimes in the short term 
life is never going to be 100% fair we may not be able to identify everybody we may not be able to be fair to everyone in the short term that's why i say before 5 years we consider you a new joiner before 5 years are over so be patient what what is your average retention because in the world that we live in today it's very rare for people to say i will work for 5 years in an so, organization so medium to senior management 5 years we consider as new joiner so sarbir is now been about 3 years he's new in the system just like obviously he's he's gotten involved very rapidly but that's the that's the thinking so many people will stand up and say yeah i'm new to the company and that's up to about 5 years so i'm just giving you the number the number for us a cut off point is about 5 years we have more than 100 people who are 10 years old please appreciate in the entire management team at that time they may they may be 150 people 10 years ago like i'm talking about 2013 so maybe 200 people so of them at least half of them are still here and uh, yeah we take um, we take um, great pride that those 100 do well and the fact that others who are patient eventually do well still sticking to culture i'm trying to distill policy bazaar's success longevity down to elements of its culture you talked about honesty to a fault you talked about iota selflessness and now you talked about patience and trust is there any other value which is very key we work with urgency so see while we are patient hmm, i was just about to say <laughs> at the that, same right? time we work with urgency uh so work with urgency work with purpose be so uh, how, uh, how, how i mean and how does an employee reconcile patience and urgency at the same like yeah so uh, there we are being, being a bit selfish as a company we are saying be urgent with your work be patient for the rewards <laughs> and and maybe we are being selfish right but but in a way we know our truth we are also being honest and telling you up front that there is no way that um, so I'll give an example right one guy pretty much after the ipo uh, came here and said um, what's in it for me for the future i said why he says i can get 1 crore outside uh, out here my compensation is 65 lakhs doesn't add up i said how much have you made in the last 7 years that you've been here so he said um, yeah i've made about 20 crore rupees I said, could you have made that? Like you could have, but in general, were you expecting to make that when you joined here? He said, no. But he said, but that's done. So I said, what makes you think that my colors will suddenly change, or our colors will suddenly change, that we will stop all necks for you to make money? He, he basically, he's a nice guy, but he didn't have trust, and he didn't have patience. so he moved on gone and joined a corporate i can promise you 5 years from now he'll repent that decision and i'm not being harsh to him or bad to him it's just i just feel bad i I'm, i'm not saying he could have continued here forever but all i'm saying is according to me it was a terrible decision which i feel bad about but bad about not going to hurt the company in any way but because it's going to end up hurting him uh because life is long and you know there's another 15 years of fun ahead and and of course we will grow and we will grow in value and employees will make lots again when they add value but it will be when they add value it can't be without adding value right and that's where the new esop thing that we are going to plan is going to be you know market price linked and all that stuff so that from here onwards as you add value you derive a lot of there's no problem nobody is saying that if the company value just saying over the next 5 years let's say let's say triples nobody is saying management can't have 10% of it of the of the growth nobody is saying that but the point is it can't be that the value would not grow and management would take 10% that also can't be that's a, that's also stupidity right so i think as long as somebody is willing to have a honest conversation and align we are happy to create uh, but sometimes people don't have the patience because they say it didn't happen today those people usually tend to be their own enemies how right. do you how do you teach 
and mentor people in the organization then see people in the organization come up with lots of ideas lots of thought processes and it's about uh, our framework uh, and aligning people on that framework that how will we evaluate how will we look at things how will we uh, build businesses what's our ethos uh, those are the things that we really focus on then keeping then eventually watching the numbers also it can't be just strategy see having a good strategy is okay but every once in a while you need to see the numbers also so then holding people honest to the numbers being them that's that's basically senior management role yeah what else uh, does senior management do and you know culturally making sure things are not going off people's interests are not misaligned etc etc those are the things that you spend time on i'm sure you've interviewed hundreds possibly thousands of people from the time that you started policy bazaar not really but okay let's let, let's say dozens or possibly at least hundred right? what do you have great open ended questions that you ask people no what are your conversations typically see i like? don't treat any relationship differently i had an arranged marriage before i went to see my wife i had already decided i'm getting married before seeing her right uh it was the same uh, i i probably got rejected by five six girls but i did not reject anyone okay that's not my philosophy i would almost not meet is that the reason why you said that you haven't done so many interviews yeah 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 so, so you don't do interviews i don't do too many interviews i because you don't say no I don't, don't say no very well, and and not just that, I like to, like think about it, right? Who are the senior people we've hired? They are almost all people whom I have known for two, three, four, five years. We are not people who, you know, we don't have for at least the people I hire. Almost nobody is without relationship. Now that's both a weakness and a strength. We, we, you can say we are not open-minded to looking at hundreds of people. right uh, we've never had a head hunter we've never had uh, you know anything of that sort uh, yeah that is a weakness also that's a strength also so for example when sarabir came in it's not like we had a head hunting firm looking for a ceo and then we had 20 candidates and then we narrowed down to 3 and then we said okay these three are the ones that our board will interview and basically the coffee with with sarabir and me requesting him would he would you consider joining us two of you went to iit delhi together he was my senior by two years somebody i respect a lot uh, then and now and even today we have difficulty because in a way he's my senior and in a way i am his senior but we don't behave that way but point is yes we do have those dynamics exist those dynamics exist right but uh, there were very specific reasons because uh, i i respected him quite a bit but it was it was almost a tentative conversation where i didn't even know whether he would consider it and he also said look if somebody else would have said it i may not have even thought about it because i'm doing my thing but because it's you give me a weekend he came back after the weekend and said yes by now we had not discussed salary we had not discussed compensation by the way we never discussed it what was the trigger for it for you to reach out to him or to bring on board a ceo we were going public in in a few years uh see uh I also wanted to distance myself a bit from the organization because please understand I'm a, I'm the founder and as a founder having worked 13 14 years with the same team you develop a certain amount of uh, affection which you cannot um, always act on rationally uh so while you have a very good team you know that look however honest you are you are leaving some gaps because of proximity because of very deep relations so i wanted somebody to come in the middle and only somebody whom i could trust so much that it would it's almost like you know an extension you of have you have kids i i i call it i that's how i explained to to sarbir also i don't know if you've seen that movie the english movie the mom where this woman is sort of developing cancer and so she needs another lady whom her husband is seeing to come in and manage her children and how that woman has to develop a relationship with the children uh, while this person is sort of dying in a way right and it's a very very difficult relationship so so the company and the people are like my kids but i also know that i could be harming them by being too close to them and so they need somebody who's probably not as close and who can be a lot more rational and open minded and also bring in new people because also our organization was not very good at bringing in new people we were getting stuck because i had hired a few new people and at a senior level they would get pushed off because 
the the, culture this is the mafia was too strong if i would use the wrong word right but um, so it was important to bring in somebody who was not part of that uh and so and he's a, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a fantastic guy i also think he's much smarter than i am etc etc uh, although over, over time i realized there are a few areas where i can be uh, quite good also so i approached him from that perspective uh he he joined and uh, i think everything has moved in the direction that it that i thought it would in the sense because the team took to him very quickly he's brought in a lot of fresh talent so i'll give you an example right we had a very good i <laughs> obviously say about myself let's say level 1 level 2 and level 2 and a half were very good but we were struggling to develop level 3 and level 4 i think sarbi coming in very rap- because people were not moving in that direction he's he's been able to build level 3 and level 4 he's been able to question i i had a massive aversion to physical meetings because i thought too much wrong can be communicated etc etc in them uh he he tried those things right i come with a very strong bias for what's going to work and what's not going to work uh he doesn't he's he's happy to try out a lot of things so if you think about you know physical uh, or corporate business or uh, uh you know the claim support a lot of things he's tried he's extremely disciplined so the way i see it is i was more like a brazilian football team he's more like the german football team very organized very structured will succeed at everything maybe a little less passionate about the cause credit where it's due i think i'm very very passionate about the reason why we exist by virtue of being a founder as well yeah perhaps perhaps uh i think i think also as a person he doesn't get very passionate about any thing he's just he's a little more professional than german me. team yeah German team I think German team yaar yeah, is not the team people cry about Next you'll hear Archit Gupta of Clear when talking about employees Archit was very specific he told me why investing into the sincere and honest people in the organization is necessary and why getting them to rise up in the organization over time is important In fact he went on to tell me how people chose to stay despite his shortcomings as a leader and how he is now working to make up for it we've always believed that a gtm should be a strength so we've invested also on it and i was focusing over there a lot more what i figured was the uh, and covid sucked at this like uh, the we did not have the rituals and practices to be very very excellent in shipping things when we were all remote i think we struggled with it uh, especially to be enterprise grade i think consumer overall we were fine but enterprise grade stuff for b2b and that's where the listening at scale at b2b i i, I think we can get much better and we are getting better but the the um, and that's why we are now back to work from office i think we didn't have 5 the, days a week yeah all 5 days a week we didn't have the rituals and the practices to be excellent at work collaborating remotely so what that meant was the products that were coming out were were missing the mark somehow like they were they were okay I, and i think not art, crafted yeah not crafted like and so i think the and our and like sort of like it, uh, dna wise it hurts us when our products are not crafted well because i think the our teams like we are not in a sexy space right like teams don't people individuals who choose to join us make a very deliberate choice to join us so people who join us are generally if i had to go like are sincere earnest folks like not like flashy folks who are in our company for the wrong reason generally we have had like a fairly consistent earnest and sincere culture so what that meant is uh, that they were trying to do their best but we still miss the mark here or there so what i realized was the uh, the sort of craft focus <clears throat> taste creating the right space and sometimes the pressure to hit a prototype to the market but sometimes creating the space for the team to and that those judgment calls i started getting involved a lot more and uh, and then like personally uh, setting up the team for success and spending that time so i think that transformation is uh, helping a lot talking about people is there anything that you changed your mind when it comes to 
managing people over time oh, this is a very big topic for me like a whole lot i i think i've gone from being a very crappy uh, leader i think uh, <clears throat> to being at least consciously aware that i uh, every day i have to come into work and make it better i i feel we made a lot of initial mistakes uh, i feel why, like why were you why did you consider yourself a crappy leader earlier on i think like in hindsight i know i was an of course leader, not in force no, but i think i'm talking about that self awareness like right. you know what do you know now about the past you uh, which you now want to change right so one is uh, like actively managing people's uh, growth uh, within clear i think uh, we were uh, we never thought about it and so consequently then actions did not happen where uh, i think uh, there were a bunch of folks who who've trusted us and fortunately some of them have stuck around and they have grown with us uh, but there have been patches where we have not uh, grown as a company uh, like <clears throat> due to whatever factors like w- whether it was execution macro what have you in those in those junctures people can leave and if we and some people did leave some people chose to stay now the people who cho- who chose to stay chose to stay despite uh, like my sometimes misguided leadership and what have you and i think uh, over there now we are far more intentional so if i were kind of blunt you're saying that they chose to stay despite you not because of you and the shift that you want to make now is to make sure that more people are staying so i'm giving the myself the harshest well. score i can of course i yeah, think so as ceos that's that's and founders especially yeah, yeah. that's so, always you hold yourself up to the highest standard yeah so over here i would say like we could have like when i look back we could have been done a much better job like being intentional in giving people uh, different roles uh, offering uh, more offering more of us to them being more uh, can i ask you to be more specific because i mean the the original question was what have you changed your mind about managing people so right so the big things is uh I think a few things which are which come with scale I I don't worry about them too much like going from a three people company to a 800 people or a, at peak 1000 people company uh, the organizing teams setting up teams I think over there it is all learned capabilities learned skills so I think over there I'm not uh, too worried I think we made the mistakes which all growth stage startups go through not too bad like I think the part where intentional about these are our people we have to focus on their careers their success figure out ways to grow them uh and if they are bringing a like the right uh like if they're bringing the right attitude uh, how do we partner with them till it hurts mindset shift is what i'm talking about like i think that mindset shifted for me uh like about a few years ago but i wish it had shifted very early on so is it i'm i'm still not sure that i fully understand but are you essentially saying that you can't you shouldn't leave the career growth of your best people only to them but you need to have like a very strong plan yourself also to partner them and to give them a career is is that what you're hinting that's, at that's that's one part i i think that's not could like the yeah perhaps so, clarify yeah i think <clears throat> like a more recent example for like let me quantify it right like a more recent example is we uh for uh, 20 folks right now we have invested in leadership coaching for example recently now it's not functional it's about them becoming more self aware them be- uh, them discovering their true strengths and doubling down on those strengths and uh, and answering some very deep questions about themselves so now this may seem very like someone called it therapy for executive leaders <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so this may seem very uh, soft and what have you but from our perspective we are saying like we want to create high performance teams and high performance teams need to be called out and uh, there's been there needs to be a culture of coaching them and so external coaching good internal coaching now we run very deep programs uh, some teams are very good at it now some teams uh, kind of suck so we are uh, asking Uh, everybody to raise bar third example would be our teams having enough confrontations uh, what we realized is uh, 
to grow, we have to give critical feedback as well. So it's not just the career growth element. The career growth element is the output of many inputs going right. So I think the first one is being very intentional that people matter and we will invest behind our people. And that is the biggest shift that I have made. But now I have to make the entire company make and pockets of it have gotten there, pockets of it have to get there. So but getting to that is very, very important. And I think we uh, like simple examples, right? Like, so I want to give more color and flavor. I think we bootstrap for four years, right? And uh, till Y Combinator funding happened, we had no zero external validation. So I think that... The, so just to be clear, you were just losing money for the first... Because when you say bootstrap and you were also running clear tax, the consumer facing side... And you weren't, like, there wasn't a lot of revenue coming in back then, right? So because we, we, were free. we were charging something uh, to some users. So, All right. Like, so we were getting some revenue. but So we there were, was some revenue coming in, but, but you were still burning money yeah, for the first funded. four years. Yeah, yeah. So we had, like, uh, I mean, some savings I had from the Bay Area. <clears throat> and, uh, like, I think, uh, basically, <clears throat> we were living on a shoestring budget. and <clears throat> And, like, we were obviously... Uh, like we were obviously not in a good financial situation as a company at that time right so but coming back right like the for the first four years no external validation so all validation came from doing right by customers internal validation and what have you now what I did not uh, give importance to and understand at all uh, because my work life was a very like my professional work was very few years so I hadn't gotten to that like that we need to appreciate people when they do something right create uh, the right environment where people feel part of the community part of the group when they get something right they sort of feel that connection and the good and so a lot of basics right connection valuing people uh, appreciating them the practice of gratitude the confrontations necessary to give tough but necessary feedback, uh, investing in people's growth, identifying strengths and weaknesses, a lot of these investments were never made. So I I feel the overall challenge of going from 300, three people to 1000 people, I, I mean, that like is a journey filled with managerial mistakes, which every first time founder makes and I've made and all organizations must go through their own respective learnings in that part right so I'm not too stressed on that part I think the just taking customer obsession along with the obsession. people obsession employee obsession would have been awesome I think that's one thing which like for example Y Combinator doesn't talk about like and if they start inculcating those practices and habits to early stage founders that'd be great because if you can make uh, the customer top topic top of mind make the people topic also top of mind and I think founders are smart resultant tree will grow differently and it'll be fine Lastly MN Srinivasu or Vasu as he's often called spoke to me about how he built Build Desk by essentially teaching the first set of employees to be well versed in the lines of business Build Desk was creating this is part of Build Desk's culture Another crucial part, as Vasu explained, is that Buildesk has done away with defined hierarchies and designations. There is a broad belief in patience at Buildesk. Why does patience matter? What allows his employees to be patient? And how do you find meaning in practicing it? How big is uh, Buildesk today in terms of, let's say, employees? Uh, Buildesk itself is about 800 employees. Give or take a couple of years, 800 Oh, wow, that's for the quantum of payments that you handle. That's not a very large organization, uh, especially in these days when we are talking about um, startups that have thousands and thousands of employees. Is this by design? Uh, very much by design. But while even, even as I come back to it, I... Don't I mean there are different philosophies of how you build company, right? In today's times or in the let's say last seven eight years, it's been an easier approach to build companies by throwing money and people. F 
fundamentally, if you're building a business, you look at what resources are available, what's and how expensive, how cheap they are. In the last few years, time has been the most precious commodity. Money and people have been easier to come by. Uh, and success and failure have had different connotations. So it's okay to uh, to kind of build something, hire a thousand people, doesn't work, fire them or let them go and move on. Uh, for us, it didn't work then, it's unlikely to work now because it has essentially two philosophies. One in terms of, are we that kind of a people or a business who kind of believe in saying, let's take a shot at something and see whether it works or not. I think we more come from a depth of, we have an understanding of what would be needed. Uh, it might take time to win that game, but we are more, I think, long term, just as a DNA, we are more long term, more institution building, more uh, lasting, building something lasting is a natural way of doing things. Uh, and that by definition means you have, you can think through stuff. Uh, that's one part of the business. From a people perspective, uh, the focus has always been, we were building a business in a domain that didn't have uh, experts or any prior kind of, there were no other company, we were among the first to start. So you kind of have to train people to get there. Uh, so to that extent, it's easier to say, we'll get good people, train them, empower them, give them enough freedom, whatever all the, uh, give them enough work in the way they are interested in. Uh, which then kind of eliminates the need to have five people doing something. One person is, people in, inherently are capable of doing a lot more if they're invested into what they're doing and if they understand what they're doing. If they're operating in the periphery, then it's like a siloed bit. But uh, we've always had a different philosophy there. You mentioned the senior management team, which in many organizations would also be called a leadership team. I would like to understand how has the idea of a leadership team and the actual leadership team evolved at Buildesk from the time that you started. The original leadership team would have been the two, three of you, right? And today, that leadership team would be very different. But I'm sure it's gone through evolutions in your own minds, perhaps, of what is a leadership team? How big should it be? Uh, what should it do, etc. So I've never been able to figure out if, you know, the buzzwords of we pivoted, we evolved. To say we didn't pivot, we didn't evolve, whether good or bad signals, right? Mm. I, I will, that's for only time to tell. I don't even kind of particularly believe anybody external can judge on those. But a couple of facts of Buildesk. When we started in 2000, beyond the philosophy we discussed, we also did one more thing. We said Buildesk would have uh, no defined hierarchy for people in the traditional organization sense and no designations. 23 years later, we still stick to that. Uh, we have no designations. I mean, uh, other than what is a regulator required to say, a company secretary, so I mean, those kind of uh, asks So apart. what are people called? People are just called a member of a certain team. A, a, a appointment letter would say you're a member of a technology team, member of a business team, right? You could be a member of a team with a, let's say a one crore salary, you could be the member of a team with a five. Like your appointment letter will not read different, your designation will not read different. You could be sitting in the office next to a person who's 120th your salary or 20x your salary. There is no carved out places for people. They're fixed places to it. It's not we are saying it's a hot spot for anybody. But there is genuinely no uh, hierarchy in terms of saying pe people of will sit here, they will have whatever. The, uh, the but there must be a reporting hierarchy. There is there is a re working relationship. So I said, therefore, where does what does that what did why did we start? That's one of the obviously the joys of starting something and you can define your own rules. It came from two reasons. One, as I said, we, in times we were building and in the space we were building, it, they weren't, there wasn't talent in the market. You had to build that talent. So the idea was when you get in the first 10 people, you might have been, let us say, a, a banking relationship guy in a bank. The idea was to get you in, train you in the product we were building and then figure out if your natural inclusion was the client relationship handling the product or the business. So in the initial teams, that's how it started saying, we're getting people. India had no definition of product at that point. See, technology was IT. In those days, just to use the word, you had IT and MIS teams. You didn't have a vertical called product. No bank had a team called payments. And you had relationship management people in the traditional sense within banks or other organizations. But that definition was more, you know, of just purely managing relationships, right? We needed, in our context, uh, the relationship manager being able to handle whether it was a GM in a bank or a, 
officer, explain to them the product, be able to answer questions, okay, how does something work, be able to demo it, give them comfort, right? So we needed a more well-rounded, let's say, personality, of, which means the person had to have skills of product and little understanding of tech, a little understanding of the legal framework to the business offering. So that's how we, when we got our initial 10, 20 people, all were kind of groomed into all these roles. Sort of like a general management program. Effectively, right? But again, I said, this. we didn't distinguish between a two-year profile or a 10-year profile. This is about, we said, and this is where we won in the initial is against our competition, right? Because uh, I'm, I know I'm jumping topics a bit, but the difference between build desk and then that time competitors was, a competitor would go make a pitch, let's say to a, in a bank or a merchant with a certain thing. And the person would say, I need to know something more. And they would say, okay, we'll come back with four teams. Build desk case, the person would say, tell me and I'll tell you the four teams right across the table. We built a capability to a level, and we've done this, where you'd go for a meeting, start explaining the construct, but the person across the table had the ability to walk you through the product, the tech, through the agreement, and if you're okay, sign it there, right? It, it, to that level. So that's how we built it. That's how people remain. So in many ways, you're also trying to create more founders because typically founders are these um, Swiss Army knife skills kind of folks, right? Where they can do client conversations, build a product, understand customer success requirements, etc., and all that. Is that what you were trying to do? Uh, to be very honest, I don't think we would, we would, we would have articulated then that were even now. Uh, I know it, it would be a good thing to say that we are targeting, but honestly not. What were we trying to do? We said that we are trying to build an organization. At that point, we didn't have an idea of how many people we would need to rescue. We just said it can't work in a new territory with us. You may as well build the resource base. We saw that as part of a response saying we need to train 10 people in all ways for them to deliver the best for Build Desk, also for them to figure out what they're good at. And in turn, give them freedom to say if they needed four people or 14 people, you define it that way. And somewhere that became cultural, right? So today also you have people who would have these skills. Uh, when we're building founders, uh, if I were to take that path, uh, then the one ingredient we didn't push into them is the ambition or the aspiration to break away to do something new on their own to explore their potential. We always said we're giving this freedom, we're giving the choice. What you would perhaps do elsewhere, you could do here, right? Uh, and if you had to go out, it would be for a different. If you're only if you're dissatisfied here, right? And I think many of, if I were to look at the first hundred people in Build Desk, uh, got over the first five years, I would venture to 70, 80 percent of them are still around, right? So I think in some sense of what we gave them as an opportunity platform that's worked for them. Uh, they've got perhaps all the freedom a founder gets in a different organization without the responsibility or the headache of figuring out the, the investor and the capital side of things. Uh, to, uh, to come back to my question, so therefore, the leadership team or the senior management team, what does it look like at... Uh, yeah. I know you've given me like the philosophical answer to there are no designations, but... I mean, out of out of the 800 odd people who work at this thing. So it's you, more role led of hmm. what they're doing at the point in time. If I were to give today the, and define the team as in, in a typical leadership meeting, we would get in, let us say, 18 people, including the founders, okay. 3 plus 15. But why you will not get a sharper answer from this, maybe if I can index it, because one way people readily understand the absence of designations. Hmm. I could tell you, for example, that if you had EVPs and age, you know, uh, uh, Associate, that's one way to define it. Mm. The other way for you to define that if you assume people's compensation is reflective of the role or the mm. structure, uh, the ratio continues. The leadership team would have a person who's X and somebody who's 10X. So it's it's not so, it's not from that. So if you're saying in a certain function, so it, that leadership team would have ref, uh, people from all aspects, whether it is the business side, the product, tech, finance, HR, compliance, legal everywhere, right? And clearly it would follow that some of the functions uh, would not scale in salaries as fast as, let's say, tech or product in today's context. So at one level, that is that uh, uh, reflection. But um, yeah, but the leadership team typically would have 15 people who, if we had founders had a message to for the organization to deliver, the 15 people are represented in the pool that can convey this and make it work through the organization. So we get in people in the meeting who then have the ability to kind of take down a message or get something implemented. What are some of the markers of 
leaders at builders what kind of traits might they possess he again in a 20 year history uh, we've uh, we've tried to build a team that possesses multiple markers with the ability to to bring sharp focus to a certain marker at a uh, point in time given market right but as an underlying thesis uh, the key mark would be I don't know if I, I would define a stability and integrity core marker, right? Uh, so that seems to align well with a lot of the stuff that you talked about, Buildesk as an organization and how it sees the world. So right. naturally, even yeah. the employees have to see the world in the same way. Correct. And if I were to add to it, right, it's be- because the structure that we have and the kind of, I would think of it as great freedom to rely on the replace on people. You can build some of things like, let's say, various parts, whether it's from a compliance, integrity, process. You build either through process or through people, right? We have tended to build that at some level through people with processes being a sec- check, right? So it's not that if there's something that you as an employer are doing, there'll be 50 processes to go through, right? There is, we would want to focus on the fact that the leader there has the right integrity. And I say integrity across various things, integrity in thinking to execution to financial integrity to various parts of it. And then leave it for them to build, right? So that would be the core marker, I would say. Uh, uh, second is patience. Uh, uh, the third aspect you should know, I mean, again, consistent, no hierarchy to no. Uh, we also have never had financial metrics as KRS for anyone, right? Because the, as I said, today maybe we would do it differently, but context of times to what we wanted to achieve, we, we believe that if people could do the right things w- with the right set of opportunities being given, the build desk objective and the founder vision is being, being met. It was not something that we needed to measure through financial metrics. Interestingly, one of the traits that you said for those who get to be successful at build desk is patience. Now, no one comes with inbuilt with patience, right? Patience is, I would say it's an enabling, it gets enabled in a certain kind of environment or organization, right? Like, you know, you could bring the same person, place them in two different organizations. In one, they would end up being patient. In the other one, they might just leave. So what is it in the build desk operating environment that allows employees to be patient? Because it's it's not, it's it's rarer and rarer today for employees to be patient because, you know, they see everyone getting promoted every year, jumping jobs, and here you're saying be patient. How? Uh, uh, I, I talked of it as being a virtue that you'd find within the leadership team. Uh, and, and yes, you would be right in extrapolating, saying that becomes one of the attributes that gets a person to succeed. Um, I think a lot of it is get at that level gets filtered at a, in the hiring stage, I guess, that you're looking for uh, a certain kind of gravitas to the person. You're looking for some terror. I mean, you can make out, especially at senior level as to how composed, calm they are, the how thoughtful they are and what they say or do. And I think there's some bit of a selection process that happens that we obviously get some, sometimes we do get it wrong and they, that naturally gets filtered at some time. Uh, but yes, I think it's, it's at that level. Now, can you, does it work for all the 800 people in Builders? I would perhaps say no, but uh, because it's very tough, the earlier discussion we're having to assess that attribute in somebody who's fresh out of college starting. They are you know, bouncing with energy. So there's a way you leverage that. But at a larger level, right, uh, f- even for those kind of people, because you're not building for something, we say, let's try it for a week, like a functional doesn't work, we'll pull it off, which is more, a- again, if you look at the b- business, we are a, a platform that's supporting other businesses. You're not directly consumer facing. So there is no great reward or glory in saying, can I experiment with the functionality which gets a million likes or a million views and people can move out. There is no, so to that extent, a, that's, as I said, uh, therefore, that's the quality we look for. And B, over a period of time, I think people who stay on are the people who meet, who like that aspect of the business we're building. Uh, 
I mean, there are, I mean, as I said, it has somewhere has to meet with a person's profile. A person who's naturally has a different way of doing things or is happier to do with a different focus in terms of time length. That there obviously will be people who want to deliver something, see victory in week 10 days, 15 days. Right? Uh, those kind of people, obviously, we, we benefit from them uh, in certain projects when they come in. And whether they choose to stay or not is a question of how they are evolving them, those people. Having said that, I said, this is not a comment on the attribute itself, like in a like in a game of cricket, you do you do need the pinch hitter to the you need the person who can kind of stay on on the turf, right? Uh, when you're building something for the long term, you're, so we clearly know we're not playing the 2020, right? You are playing the test match where in, there'll be times when you need the pinch hitter, but you we recognize that we're playing for the long term. Have there been times during Builder's evolution when you've found the need to be hands-on in building culture? We had to kind of roll up your sleeves to either fix or to imprint some aspect of culture in the organization. I think through the 20 years, I think the organizational feedback would be that in a in a in a operational sense, uh, founders like to get involved into knowing the detail and rolling up the sleeves. So directly or indirectly, that's a very large part of the culture. So as an independent effort to do a, a cultural thing has not been necessary. I, I'm interpreting your question these ways. If we, and which could well be a definition of founder today, which is to say that you're focused with a lot of energy uh, on your energy, on the external externalities to your business and maybe on the product visioning, but not in the day-to-day -day bit, right? In which case, then you kind of have to have this intervention, say, when do I step in to do something else? We've been very, very fairly well hands-on. Uh, and so to that extent, fixes happen as you go along. It's not it's not something that gets set aside as a task to be done in any format. It's ongoing always. Has that ever, because 23 years and you're still hands-on, right? Like, you know, at some point, do you, do you observe that and see that, is there a downside to that as well? of not stepping back and because at the end of the day, it's like zero sum game, right? Uh, the more hands on you are, possibly the less hands on someone else could be. Or do you not see it like that? I think there's nothing in life where there's a one zero answer, right? Uh, you, you could be totally distanced from a business and that can have its advantages. You could be totally hands on, it can have its disadvantages, right? It's about finding the right balance. I think in builders case, it's a question of what are we hands on about today versus what were we hands on about 10 years ago or five years ago. That I would venture to say is dramatically different, right? How so? So in the first years of the business, you are hands on down to a functionality of a product that's getting built because that's what's going to go out to the market. You uh, are setting basic rules of, let, let me just take an, a different example of the construct of an agreement with a partner, how do you want it to be? We were hands-on there to say, it doesn't matter whether it's the largest bank in the country or smallest bank, it will be the same fair templateness. There is nothing extra somebody gets versus not. If we are giving X to the largest bank, we will give X to the smallest bank. Now you could leave this as a process, not be hands-on, or you could say, I'm defining this and I'm hands-on then. If you're hands-on about this aspect in the first three years, it tends to become the culture. You don't need to be hands-on on this aspect later. So that's how what I mean in the change. Uh, some we are hands-on today also in, in, in what context it would be that if there's a new thing that's happening in the market uh, a new variant let's say to a UPI and a variant on it understanding implications of it opportunity set of it to what can be leverages of it we would not say four product teams go do a deep dive come back to us with the presentation right we would say we would evolve it together we want to be as much part of the discussion as opposed to being presented to saying this is the outcome of it, right? And that I believe is important in important things. We may not do that for a, a small development, but let's say UPI is a big thing. If there's a development there, we will get involved because we do believe it has long-term and material impacts, right? So that is the assessment change. Uh, 
compliance matters we want to be as hands on as time will allow which doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you're going to look at every return that is filed information goes but if there is any small tweak of a uh, compliance in understanding what it means for the company and what has to happen we we are part of the that debate or discussion so that as i said the philosophy is you're not missing on the spirit of what is intended left to let us say a larger change in important thing you could play to the word of what is required not the spirit so we make the choice of where we are hands on